Hi, today we're going to do some myth busting. You've probably heard that in Hinduism there are 330 million gods and that Hindus have all kinds of strange worship and all kinds of funny, fancy, weird beliefs. I'm here to break a whole bunch of myths, so come with me and let's go on a really fascinating journey. Welcome back. My name is Rohit. On this channel we talk about self-love, soul love and divine love. And today we're going to take on the topic of divine love at its most ancient root and that is from India. I grew up in India in a Hindu family and I would say that I don't actually subscribe to any particular religion at this time, neither Hinduism nor any other. What I do have religion of the heart, if you want to call it that. A feeling of love for the divine, for God, for all beings, and for the world, and for myself. And that's why I talk about these things with such great passion. But I did grow up with Hinduism, and I'd love to clear up a few things that have been myths that are brought up to me by many people as I go along the journey of life. So the first of them is the idea that there are 330 million gods. Now, while it's true that there are many, many different quote-unquote gods in Hinduism, starting with Brahma being the creator, Vishnu being the maintainer, Shiva the destroyer, Durga is considered as Ma or mother, mother goddess. Um, you have Kali who is very fierce and destroys demons. You have Vayu, the god of the wind. You have Surya, the god of the sun. And a lot of that resembles the Greek mythology. But I want to take up that word mythology for a moment. That was introduced by the British uh, onto the Indian landscape. They considered everything that was in the Indian scriptures and the Indian belief system as being mythology. And everything that they had to offer in their monotheistic religion of Christianity or Catholicism to be the superior version. So Indians actually began to look down upon their own belief systems and began to doubt them and began to think of themselves as inferior. But I think that was a great disservice and a great myth that was perpetuated upon the Indian population. And today, all over the world, those ideas still exist. The idea of 330 million gods is actually quite false. The devas, as they are actually called, the word deva is the Sanskrit word for what are perhaps demigods, are essentially... Jiva Atma. Jiva Atma refers to souls like you and I. We are all Jiva Atma, which means we are small, infinitesimal particles of the divine. We are not the divine. Some people like to say in today's context, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. But that is not actually true. We are particles of the divine, drops of water from the ocean of the divine. So in that context, all the devas are all Jiva Atma. They constitute an entire governing body that manages the universe, just as you have people in government positions, and there are millions of such in each country managing the affairs of that country. So also in the affairs of the universe, there are millions of demigods. But above them lies the supreme, and of course there's much contention in the Indian philosophy about whether that supreme is actually a being or an energy. The idea of the universe has become extremely popular. Most people think of the uh, of the supreme uh, or God as being an energy, something impersonal. And while this is very convenient for those who have been wounded by the idea of a God who punishes and sends people to hell and don't want anything to do with such a being, so therefore they find it very comfortable to either become atheists or to become impersonalists, people who believe in an impersonal God because such a being will not send anyone to hell. <laughs> but you see, I grew up with a very different notion of God, a notion of God as a little child who was playful and fun-loving, who grew up to be a lover, um, a romantic, a sensual being who enjoyed life and taught others to do the same, who invited us to be able to come and join him and her, Radha and Krishna, in their divine abode, which, according to Western theologians, would be heaven. 
So the idea of a supreme being is very, very clear in the Vedic uh, theology. It begins, it has three aspects to it. The presence of, the God, of God found in everything, which is known as Brahman, the presence of the divine in every atom of the creation. Then the presence of the divine in every one, Paramatma, the great soul. Not Jivatma as the demigods and all of us, but Paramatma, the great soul who is present in every one of us, but still doesn't make us God. Paramatma and Jivatma sit together in each of us. God is present within each of us, guiding us. And finally, Bhagavan. Bhagavan means not only the great soul, but the possessor of all opulences, all knowledge, all fame, all beauty, all wealth, all renunciation. It's just a way of expressing that which is the origin of everything. And that statement is made in the Bhagavad Gita, also known as the Song of God, uh, which is spoken by Krishna about 3000 BC on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, where he says, I am the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise, knowing this, worship me with their heart. That brings us to a really interesting point. The same point that is made in the Bible, where it is mentioned that the two commandments that are actually the first two commandments, and Christ said, I've come to abolish the law, all the other commandments, I've come to abolish them and to install and make preeminent the first two, because that is all you need. And what were those first two? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. So a divine love, a love of God. And two, to love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you look at it, this is really the same concept as is there in Hinduism. The idea to love God, the idea to love each other, as in to love the divine within each other, and to be able to love the creation, Brahman. Because, you know, if you don't, if you love the creator, but not the creation, it's like if you love an artist, but you don't love the art that that artist creates. If you love a person, but you don't love their child, or even their dog for that matter, then you really can't have a relationship with that person. So I think it's just very logical to see that those are the things that really matter, and not all the rules and regulations that are part of most religion. So the whole idea of worshipping of devatas is, is taken up by Krishna during his time because Krishna is declared by the Vedas and by all the saints and people of that time to be the original Bhagavan, the, the highest being, the supreme being, from whom comes Brahman. Krishna says very clearly that Everything emanates from even the spiritual worlds, the Brahman, everything, the material worlds, the entire cosmos emanates from him. That everything is, is rests upon him as pearls are str strung upon a thread. He gives that analogy to indicate that nothing can exist separate from him. He also states that I am seated in everyone's heart. From me alone comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So if you want to forget God, that's fine. You want to remember God, you can do so. The idea now comes down to, well, if we are going to want to love God, how do you love a God you've never seen? And so comes the idea of Krishna's pastimes and where he shows how he lives. What does God do? What does God look like? What kind of relationship can I have? And he shows relationships of all kinds, that of a friend, that of a lover, that of a parent. Every possible relationship is possible with God. One doesn't have to look at one particular entity such as Krishna as God. One can take open that up wide. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter that you want to consider of the divine as being an energy. That is fine. As long as we come to God, whether this through this path or any other, the idea is to get there. The idea is that you shall know them by their fruit. You shall know one who is in love with God, not because of the religion they belong to, but because of, their, of the fruit of their devotion, of their dedication, of their love. Not by the fact that they are more aggressive in converting other people, not because they are there trying to convince everyone of their way, but because they love God and love each other and actually embody that love with the way they deal with each other, where they treat each other as divine beings, where they treat themselves as a divine being. And then above all, they see that all of this comes from the source or the universe or God, whether you conceive of that as personal or impersonal. So in summary, I'd like to say 
that a lot of these myths about demigods, 330 million gods, and so on and so forth are false. And for those who believe that some of them, whether it's Shiva or someone else, might be the supreme being, that is not established through any of the Indian scriptures. The unfortunate part is most of most people do not read those books, do not take the time, but if you do get a chance, do read the Bhagavad Gita. It will help make things clear for you, and you'll find your answers clearly mentioned over there. So I'll talk more about divine love in further talks, but for now, I'd like to leave you with just this simple idea that there is a possibility for divine love. It exists for all of us, and we don't need to be divided through different religions. This is the way of the heart. It is whether you're a Sufi or whether you're a Bhakta, which is the devotional love in, in the Vedic culture, or whether you're a Christian, we all have the ability to form a relationship with God, to have a loving source connection, which we then bring into our lives with each other. Because then when you have that model, you have that archetype of what divine love looks like, what God looks like, that you understand that that God is not someone who's going to judge and punish you, but is someone who wants your love. You can't impress God with any amount of offerings, with any amount of prayers or chants or mantras or this or that, but it is with your heart. Therefore, Krishna says, they worship me with their heart. So the path to God is therefore, according to me, a path of devotion, of love. Yes, there is the path of the yogis, the path of meditation, the path of oneness, and that is an equally valid path. But Krishna says that for those in the discussion with Arjun, uh, in the 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he says, those who worship me with devotion, I pick them up from the ocean of birth and death and bring them back to me. The path of the yogi is equally powerful and valid. However, it's a do-it-yourself path. You've got to work hard. You've got to do the work, as they say. You've got to do the inner work, the outer work. You, it's up to you. But the path of devotion is a path of surrender. It is a path of letting God support you and help you and care for you and nurture you and uplift you through surrender. So that's the path of devotion that I most am attracted to, have been attracted to ever since I was a young child. And I'd love to have your comments and discussions about that. I know you will disagree, and that's perfectly fine. I'd love to hear your views. I'd love to have your opinions. And I'd love to have your questions and perhaps things you'd like me to talk about further. Please also subscribe to this channel and comment. Your comments mean a lot to me. They inspire me. They move me for further. And your subscriptions will mean that you'll get notified about things that I have coming up in the future. So stay with me. Stay tuned. We're going to have lots of interesting discussion, lots of wonderful things that we're going to talk about over here. Take care and lots of love.